on the next Great Lakes Now. Are your bacon and eggs to blame for Lake Erie's toxic algae blooms? You know, over 85% of that is because of agricultural runoff, both fertilizer and manure. Lakefront cities tally up the cost of record-setting lake levels. Massive flooding everywhere in town. You lose sleep when that happens. And what's next for communities flooded by the failure of the Edenville Dam? There it goes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV. The Polk Family Fund. Eve and Jerry Young. The Americana Foundation. The Brookby Foundation. Founders Brewing Company. And viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome back to Great Lakes Now. You probably know that toxic algae blooms have become an annual summertime occurrence in western Lake Erie. Measures have been taken to prevent or shrink the blooms, but one factor that fuels them has been growing. What's become the new normal is severe toxic algae outbreaks in Western Lake Erie. That impairs clean water, it harms fisheries, it interferes with tourism and outdoor recreation, and it makes Toledo and Northwest Ohio a much less pleasant place to be. That should not become the new norm, that's not acceptable. Communities relying on Lake Erie for water, income, and recreation have been battling toxic algal blooms for years. Most notably, in 2014, citizens were told don't drink the tap water for three days. Half a million people were impacted. These toxic blooms are fueled by nitrogen and phosphorus and tended to feed crops. Both are nutrients which can boost productivity and profitability of farmers' fields. But when those nutrients wash off of fields, they can flow down the Maumee River and into western Lake Erie, feeding explosive growth of toxic cyanobacteria. On the one hand, Northeast Ohio is home to some of the highest agricultural productivity in the country. On the other, Western Lake Erie experiences intense algae blooms every summer, fueled by agricultural runoff. The challenge is to prevent cyanobacterial blooms while maintaining agricultural production. Jeff Reuter is the former director of Ohio Sea Grant's Stone Laboratory and helped lead a task force which recommended reducing phosphorus loading in Lake Erie by 40% as part of Annex 4 of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. As the amount of phosphorus on a field increases, the amount of phosphorus that runs off from that field also increases. We can look at the load that comes in out of the Maumee River, and in over 85% of that is because of agricultural runoff, both fertilizer and manure. A growing amount of that manure comes from CAFOs, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. CAFOs can house thousands of animals and, by some estimates, produce as much waste as the cities of Chicago and Los Angeles combined in the Maumee watershed. That's CAFOs, that's concentrated animal feedlot operations with thousands and thousands of chickens and pigs and cattle. That manure is then spread on fields where it runs off, gets into the tributaries which go into the Maumee River, and then make their way into Western Lake Erie. Environmental Law and Policy Center in Chicago has been studying the impacts of a growing number of factory farms in Ohio. Senior research analyst Lucas Stevens co-authored a report with Environmental Working Group. Their findings indicate that CAFOs are largely unregulated sources of the nutrients which fuel algal blooms. You can see our estimate of how much manure is being generated at all of the facilities that are in the Maumee River watershed. We found 775 animal feeding operations, and that's vastly more than are permitted in the state records. Raj Bajankawar is a physical scientist at the International Joint Commission. He helped lead the IJC report on reducing phosphorus loading in Lake Erie. 
we cannot not have agricultural practices, you know, which is important for this economy and, you know, food production. But same time, we have to be very responsible in terms of how much phosphorus we put it in rivers and lakes through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. 40% reduction on the both dissolved reactive phosphorus and the total phosphorus can reduce these blooms significantly. Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and the province of Ontario, they agreed among them they would reduce phosphorus pollution by 40% by 2025. And they'd reduce it at sort of a milestone, uh, 20% by 2020. Yvonne Lasico is Ohio Farm Bureau's Vice President of Public Policy, which represents farmers and agricultural interests at the state and federal levels. There's a lot of voluntary measures that farmers are undertaking. And then in addition, there's voluntary measures and research and programs that those farmers' member organizations, like Farm Bureau, are undertaking. We've been working collectively, not just with other farm groups, but with environmental groups and conservation groups, and figuring out how do we create baselines and how do we determine what are these best management practices that we can help farmers incorporate on their farms. These are the best management practices, but these are all voluntary based. Nobody's enforcing them. You know, there is no regulatory mechanism saying, hey, you can't do this. And so the voluntary measures are ones that farmers, usually on their own dime, um, are looking at and saying, this is something that will work for my farm. This is either going to reduce how much phosphorus I have to put on, which is a cost savings, and, and this is going to reduce then how much phosphorus is coming off. But according to Jeff Reuter, phosphorus reduction in the Maumee River has not materialized. Will voluntary measures be enough? We've been trying to do it up till this point entirely voluntarily. And we've been trying to do this now for 10 years. So here we are at the end of 2019. Not only can we not see any, pro we see zero progress. Sandy Bin is the executive director of Lake Erie Waterkeeper. Her group believes not enough focus has been put on CAFOs and their nutrient contribution to the watershed. Commercial fertilizer phosphorus has gone down by 30 to 50 percent over the last 20 years. And we're looking at the data and the science and seeing that the number of animals in the watershed has increased substantially um, by about 40 percent from 2005 to 2018 with a comparable increase in the amount of manure and a comparable increase in the amount of phosphorus. So if on one side we're taking it out and we're adding it on the other, this lake is never going to recover. So in terms of them being mostly voluntary measures, that's actually not really the case. There are a lot of regulated items out there, including if you're a concentrated animal feeding operation, you have to have a permit to install and a permit to operate on an ongoing basis. While there are regulations governing CAFOs, other farms fall just below the threshold of CAFO designation and avoid regulations altogether. To be designated as a CAFO, if you're a dairy operation, you have to have at least 700 cows. If you're a hog operation, you have to have at least 2,500 pigs. Chickens, you've got to have at least one and a quarter million chickens. There are certain regulations that you have to comply with. So if you have 2,499 hogs rather than 2,500, then you can do whatever you want. You don't have to have a nutrient management plan in place to prevent you from spreading too much manure on your fields. You're, you're simply not regulated if you're below that size. If they take their manure off-site, called distribution and utilization, they don't have to tell us where it goes. They don't have to tell us how many acres. So there's a huge discrepancy in that. The Environmental Law and Policy Center has been working to identify large farms within the Maumee watershed, which have escaped CAFO designation. We can identify the barns through aerial imagery because they are very, very standardized. What you would see from the ground is very nondescript. They're sort of low slung, long barns. You wouldn't recognize it as a, a big factory. They cram as many animals as they can into these barns. They prefabricate the facilities, which you know, are automated to feed and water the animals, and then take the waste and put it either in underground storage or manure lagoons on the surface. The number of animals within these facilities has been increasing at the same rate that the dissolved reactive phosphorus has been increasing over the past two decades. 
PEFAs produce millions of gallons of liquid manure. And the fact that it's already liquid when it gets applied to fields means that it runs off easier during rainstorms, but it also means that it's more expensive to transport, which creates the siloing effect of the manure being applied to fields closer to the CAFO, which means that it accumulates nutrients in the soil. On the manure side, where it's, you know, you could put in the soil, 150 parts per million of phosphorus. Um, that's not what you need to grow a crop. You need 40 parts per million or less. That's what the commercial fertilizer people use as their guideline, if you will. Well, the problem is that our current guidelines allow too much manure to be applied, more than is needed for maximum crop production. So rather than fertilizing with the manure, really what we're doing is waste disposal. If in fact it's to replace fertilizer, it should be having the same rules as fertilizer. And that's a huge effort that a lot of us are advocating for. You know, and the response we get from meat and dairy is you'll put us out of business. And no one wants to put them out of business. Is it possible to reduce phosphorus levels to prevent algae blooms and have farmers make a living while producing our food? Chris Kurt is a corn and soybean farmer participating in a five-year, $1 million nutrient mitigation project supported by the Ohio Farm Bureau and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'll be honest, farmers don't always change easily. A lot, a lot of our farmers, they've done the same thing for a generation, and maybe it was passed on from the previous generation. Think of it this way. I've been spreading my manure on this 100-acre plot here every year for the last 10 years. Suddenly, you're telling me that I now need to transport that manure a greater distance, and instead of spreading it on 100 acres, I need to spread it on 1,000 acres. That's going to cost more. So if you ask a farmer, can they do more? And most of them are going to say, yes, tell me what to do. And then they're probably going to ask you, how am I going to pay for it? Because our margins are pretty thin as it is. So that funding issue is something that, that I think as a group, both farm and non-farm, we're probably going to have to work together to figure out. How do we help them cover that cost of transporting the manure a greater distance and spreading the same amount of manure on a greater number of acres? They can do it voluntarily, we can give them incentives and disincentives, or we can create regulations to make them do it. Whatever we do, we're probably gonna to have to help them financially. Joe Hammond is an organic dairy farmer who's been certified since 1997. He says the pressures on small farmers is immense to acquire more land and produce more per acre. And that as more farmers succumb to the pressures to grow bigger, maybe even to the CAFO level, the quality of the product and impacts to the environment will suffer. Well, what we were talking about is the ability to vote through your dollar. If you're gonna buy it from the cheapest uh, discount place that just deals in, in quantity, you're gonna support a farming system that's gonna think in the same trail, you know. If you want to pay that extra dollar, um, there's a reason for that, because those farmers are spending more time, more effort, and more expensive inputs to get you a quality product. If you are ready to pay for it, and put the pressure on the, your food producer to produce the food in a cleaner way, you know, they have to change. It's both mutual, right? It's all about, you know, the cost and responsibility. So that all comes right back out here to the field. What are they looking for and how do they want it raised? Fast and cheap? Or do they want something with some quality? The health of Lake Erie could hang in the balance. For more coverage of harmful algae blooms and their causes, visit greatlakesnow.org. We've seen more record high lake levels around the basin this year, and cities along the lakeshore are paying the price. After several years of high precipitation, all five Great Lakes have been at or near record levels for much of the past year. Homeowners along the lakes have had to take expensive measures to move, protect, or demolish their houses before the waves or erosion could claim them. The high water threatens public property too, and along Michigan's Great Lakes shoreline, 
the longest of any U.S. state. Many waterfront cities are facing mounting bills. The Michigan Municipal League has been tallying the cost of high water to the state city since 2019, and the number is still climbing. Harrisana Richards is a legislative associate with the Michigan Municipal League. Well, the number that we have, approximately $70 million, isn't complete. We are recognizing right now in this crisis that there's a shortage of people who are able to contract and do this work and also do those actual infrastructure projects. So you'll have a lot of communities, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, who are still waiting to get someone to come out and assess their damage and also get those estimates to really know where they are. And so that number has been growing by the day, by the month. Waterfront towns like South Haven on Michigan's western shore have incurred millions of dollars of unplanned costs. The city is a favorite of summer tourists, but record high water has shrunk the city's sugar sand beaches. And on March 5th, the city canceled its annual July 3rd fireworks, a major tourist draw and economic driver, not because of COVID-19, but out of concern that high water and waves could make it dangerous to launch from the city's iconic pier. Later that month, water levels hit another summer attraction, the city's marinas. Kate Hozier is South Haven's interim city manager and harbor master. Boating and the harbor is pretty integral to the city of South Haven. We have four municipal marinas. The harbor is kind of right in the middle, like the heart of it, and the city wraps around it. It's a vital part of what makes South Haven, South Haven. It's, I'd say it's pretty important. There's a huge economic driver that is the port with all the transient boaters that come in from the seasonal boaters who stay here. On a normal July, every slip in this marina is filled by a boat. But this year is different. In March of 2020, damage from the high water forced the city to close the 97 slip north side municipal marina for the summer to make repairs and upgrades to deal with the high water. We've shut this one down and are starting construction. So all these walkways, we're gonna build them up about 12 to 13 inches. All the new utilities, all the new electric lines, water lines will be placed on the existing walkways. Then a new decking will be placed over top. So you're raising the docks and getting new utilities. The closure and repairs are doubly draining on the city's finances. By closing the marina, you no longer have the revenue and now you have to pay for it. So you're kind of hitting hit twice. You have to come up with the money that, to make the repairs, and then, of course, you're not getting the revenue because you can't have boats in the slips. Necessary work at the city's four municipal marinas will be expensive. I would say that the high water issues have caused repairs and fixes in the range of between four and five million. Of course, the costs don't end with the marinas. On April 29th, after heavy rains, the city saw widespread flooding along its riverfront. Bill Hunter is South Haven's Director of Public Works. That day I was constantly running around worried. I kept checking all the spots. You lose sleep when that happens. Massive flooding everywhere in town. The water was high enough to threaten the city's wastewater treatment plant on the banks of the Black River. Here at this plant, this area was all underneath water, but we had these pumps here at the time, which helped us. We just had them installed. They only been running for a few weeks. Probably if that would have happened prior to the pumps, we would have had sanitary sewer overflows, meaning the sanitary sewer would flood into the Black River and to Lake Michigan untreated. That would be the worst case scenario. Another worst case scenario, Treated water should exit the plant by gravity, pouring from an outfall pipe into the Black River. But the high water means the outfall pipe is submerged, which can slow the flow from the plant. This is your effluent going out. The water, as you can see right now, is not flowing. In a normal year, you would just see the water like a creek going by, see the water just flowing. Now it's, it's just kind of stagnant. The city has had to run pumps to move the treated water out of the plant. Without the pumps, things could get ugly for anyone connected to the sewer lines. If you cannot release your treated water into your outfall, all of that gets stuck in the plant. And since it's gravity fed and it can't push out, that means it stays stuck in the plant and all the stuff that's being pumped into your system from lift stations, from homes, from businesses, stays in the line. Or if it can't move, it gets backed up into people's houses. Nobody wants sewer in their house.
The wastewater treatment plant is now protected by lines of HESCO barriers, sand-filled containers that form a wall to stop water and waves. In May, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers helped to install more barriers on South Haven's waterfront, but they aren't protecting the beach. They're protecting the city's water filtration plant and a critical 1 million gallon reservoir of drinking water that's buried beneath the sand. If you don't have that holding tank, you basically have to issue a, a system-wide boil notice. So all 11,000 people would have to immediately start boiling their water to be able to use. Elsewhere in the community, flooding has remained a problem. Around the intersection of Dunkley and Wells, the spring floods never left. That whole area is still flooded. We have two pumps already in there to dewater the area. We did that last year. This year, those pumps can't keep up, so we're proposing to put in more sandbags plus the Tiger Dam system. That's an $82,000 expense, not budgeted. Early estimates put the total cost at 11 to $20 million. As of early July, the high end of that range is looking more accurate. Of course, these problems are not without precedent. In 1986, during the last round of record-setting water levels, governments asked the International Joint Commission to prepare a report and recommend actions. Rob Sisson is one of the IJC's U.S. commissioners. When you read through it, the, the, the theme of climate change comes through loud and clear, coastal resiliency, a lot of recommendations for infrastructure, for municipalities around the Great Lakes, and those largely have sat on a shelf for the intervening years because the water levels came right down. Sisson hopes that this time, lessons learned will be acted upon. I know communities are hurting and they're going to need millions and millions of dollars of assistance to bring their systems up to speed. It's gonna be more than local governments can handle. The high water emergency that exists today does give us, I think, the ability to bring governments together and stakeholders together to discuss, let's put a plan in place for the long term. Let's get together, let's, let's build a resiliency plan for the future because we know we're gonna face higher highs and lower lows in the future. For more coverage of this year's high water levels, visit us at greatlakesnow.org. There are thousands of dams in the states and provinces surrounding the Great Lakes. In May, the Edenville Dam near Midland, Michigan failed, two years after regulators pulled its license, citing safety concerns. We asked two journalists from the news site MLive to tell us what they saw covering the story. They knew that, you know, rain was coming, you know, it was an area prone to flooding. We had all that huge rain and it was just inevitable. Everybody got an emergency alert on their phone saying, get out now, evacuate immediately. The failure of the Edenville Dam on May 19th was captured on video. There it goes. There it goes. The 21 and a half billion gallons of water in Wixom Lake poured through the breach dam. There we go, there's the rush. Wixom Lake floods out and it's pushing out into the Titabwasi River. There was just crazy amounts of debris, trees, uh, pontoon boats. I'm, I mean, it was just insane how much debris was being pulled with all this water pressure just dragging everything along with it. The floodwater and debris rushed downstream seven miles to the Sanford Dam, which was quickly overtopped. The water started to overflow, started to breach the dam, and we ended up getting evacuated out of there shortly after that, before it actually failed. The whole town of Sanford was underwater. When the floodwater finally drained to Lake Huron, Wixom and Sanford lakes were empty, and the town of Sanford was in bad shape. Most of their downtown is just completely like destroyed or the buildings are marked for demolition. Roads are completely, you know, just riddled and washed up. Houses completely gone. Right now, um, a lot of the community is in the process of, you know, working with FEMA, working with their insurance companies, seeing, you know, how they can, um, you know, get some help. Right now you have some high profile lawyers and they're 
filing uh, what's called mass tort lawsuits, um, you know, against the dam owners. The failures have also raised concerns about dam safety around Michigan and the Great Lakes region. MLive has reported on the long history of conflict between federal regulators and the dam's owners. And Great Lakes Now has covered the story on our website. We looked at how Michigan's dam safety department compares to other states around the Great Lakes. And the answer is, it's got fewer staff and less funding. We also reported on how a combination of climate change and poor infrastructure played a major part in the dam breach. The Midland Dam incident is just one snapshot of a much larger picture. Thanks for watching. You can find coverage of the Midland Dam story by Great Lakes Now and MLive at greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV. The Polk Family Fund. Eve and Jerry Young. The Americana Foundation. The Brookby Foundation. Founders Brewing Company and viewers like you. Thank you.